you know, just yeah, why don't you tell us about yourself, about your life course, how you ended up here, because that would be of interest. Mm -hmm. In terms of my professional life, uh, I've been a, a pastor, a professor, and a padre. And by that I mean I was an Orthodox priest, uh, ordained in 1982, so I've been a priest 35 years. I served three churches during that time, one for three and a half years, one for 17, and one for six. But I wasn't just being the parish priest. Uh, usually there wasn't enough income, so I had to do other jobs anyway. I've been a professor, adjunct at a number of institutions, full-time as well. Um, and the padre part is the chaplain. In the uh, British military in Canada, all the chaplains are called padre, even the imams. <laughs> I find that kind of amusing, actually. Uh, and in all three of these, of these ministries, I would call them all ministries because I feel I, I'm called to serve the people of God and also to witness to America, which is my home country, and when I've been overseas around the world, although not as obvious there as in America, um, to my faith in Jesus Christ and what it has done for me, which has given me um, a purpose, a meaning, that I rejoice every time I wake up in the morning, thank God I'm, I'm alive and I'm another day ahead. I've always had that kind of positive attitude. Now, I was raised Roman Catholic. I'm not, a, I'm not I'm a lifelong Christian, except for a couple of years in high school, when I went to an old boys Catholic high school. And at age 16, I decided, I don't need this. This was after the Vatican Council II had concluded in Rome, and there were many changes coming down in the Roman Catholic Church. That was my excuse. All these changes. I don't like these changes. But I really got into socialism at age 15, 16. So I, and then later on, I realized how foolish that was. And I'm, I lived what Winston Churchill used to say. If you're not a socialist before the age of 20, you have no heart. If you're a socialist after the age of 40, you have no head. Mm -hmm. So I've been on both sides of that. Uh, but I never, I never renounced my faith in Jesus Christ, either as a Catholic or as a secular person or as a Protestant. I became a Protestant for a while, too. But when I became Orthodox, Russian, uh, Russian Orthodox, in um, October 4, 1975, that's, what, 39 years ago? No, uh, 42. 42 years ago. Uh, this was the end of the track. This, this was, I've been in and out of church and different expressions of Christianity, but that has become, that, that's part of the core of my being. And I'm very happy that my wife followed a year and a half later. She could have said no. I didn't want to force her. She became Orthodox in March of 1977. And as I said, I was ordained in 1982, and I've been working these three different areas, pastor, professor, padre, in combination or separately for all those many years, 35 years. Excellent. And I want, I, I'm here, here at the Holy Trinity Seminary of the Russian Orthodox Church outside Russia only for about 90 so days. So I'm kind of a 90-day wonder. Uh, that was a term for, first, for second lieutenants in World War II. They get little butter bars, little gold bars. <laughs> they come out of uh, uh, basic officer training and go right into the, the Pacific Theater of Germany thinking they knew everything. And of course, the sergeants knew these guys didn't know squat. And <laughs> 90 Day Wonder. So I'm a 90 Day Wonder as dean of the seminary, professor of moral theology. And I'm working a lot of hours. I'm not complaining. I'm just pointing that out. But every day, again, I wake up what a great challenge, because this seminary is taking a, a different turn without abandoning its heritage, building upon it. But we, in fact, we've even coined a, a, new, a new brand, a new slogan, traditional orthodoxy for the 21st century. Very good. Well, thank you. Uh, since you've been to various churches and you are sensitive to comparative aspects, what is the specificity of orthodox approaches to uh, science. Is there anything specific that distinguishes it from, say, Protestant denominations or the Catholic one? The only thing I would, I could answer, uh, the only, only way I could answer that question uh, with a particular example would be perhaps in terms of the, the doctrine of creation. Now, all the Christian communities, whether Protestant, Roman Catholic, Orthodox, we all, uh, we believe in God as creator. Um, it's, it's in the creeds, it's in the Bible, that, it's indisputable. 
But I have noticed that we Orthodox, we tend to make it part of our liturgical cycle. So for example, September 1, on, the, on the, the current Gregorian calendar, which is always going to be 13 days later on the old calendar, the, the um, Julian calendar, so September 14. But uh, on the Gregorian calendar, September 1, it's the beginning of the church year. It's also a day, particularly in the ecumenical patriarchate in Constantinople, but also all of Orthodoxy, where we celebrate creation. And that has ecological implications, and to some extent, technological as well. We are to cherish creation, not simply to exploit it without any restraint or with abandon. Now, I'm not saying that's true of other faith groups, um, but we, we just have such a consciousness. Every year, this comes up in September 1. And then another feast day, which points to this, this reverence for creation, an appreciation of the created order, Even, not just humanity, angelic humanity, animal kingdoms, plant life, even inert matter, is a feast called Theophany. And that's on January 6th, 19th on the old calendar. That's when we celebrate the baptism of Jesus by St. John the Baptist. Theophany is a Greek word meaning the appearance of God. It's the first time to... Uh, in this case, Jews in Palestine, Israel in those days, where God was revealed as the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. The Son, of course, being Jesus. When he was baptized, he was immersed into the River Jordan and came up. We have a ritual that we do every year on this occasion where we bless water. And the ritual, the, the, the liturgy of the blessing of water for Theophany talks about its primordial uh, content, its meaning, which can be for destruction in case of floods or for life-giving sustenance, drinking water. But when we, way we, the way we describe this, this is in the language of liturgy, this is poetry, this is mystical literature, liturgy, and the icons show this too. When Christ descended into the water, the river Jordan reversed its flow. And you can see that in the typical icon the image of the, of the Theophany, where there are several fish going downstream, but one is going up, and it's not a salmon. Mm. This is a way showing in, in, in image, in iconography, that the river is reversing its course. Mm. Now, we don't believe it literally happened. Uh, of course, the river Jordan flowed into the Dead Sea, but this is a way of, of the, the mystical mind, the, the, um, the spiritual mind approach that the, 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 the corruption, the decay of creation since the fall of humanity has now been reversed by Jesus Christ, who is, we believe to be God incarnate, descending into the water. This begins the restor restitution of nature, the rejuvenation, the regeneration of nature. And we take that water and we also drink of it and we bless homes. We do this every year. We're, like, we're blessing the house. It's almost like baptizing the house by sprinkling, although we do immersion. But the point is, the emphasis on, on, on the created order is very profound in the Orthodox Christian tradition. So those are two ways that I think there might be a, a bit of a difference, but I'd say it's more emphasis than it is anything uh, particularly uh, uh, profound uh, or, 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 or theological. Some of the Protestant denominations tend to be very negative toward humanity. Man is depraved, he's born in sin, and... Uh, he has no claim, no rights, nothing. He, uh, God, we're lucky if God elects some of us to be, with, you know, Calvinism, for example. Uh, I recently taught a, uh, I'm teaching a course, comparative theology, here at the seminary, and I, I, I had the students read the section in Calvin's Institutes of the Christian Religion on Predestination. Whew, what a dour God that is. <laughs> this, uh, the sovereignty principle there is such that God can't even, will not even tolerate a no. When as the true Christian tradition, or the fullness of faith, I would say, is that not only does God tolerate no from us, he becomes man himself and is subject to abuse, humiliation, disgrace, torture, death, crucifixion, a despicable death, horrible death. Uh, he's still sovereign. But it's in that suffering, it's in that 
empathy for man. It's in that reaching down and becoming one of us that he shows the depths of God's wonder. Whereas the other sovereignty notion is he could not do that and remain God. So we, there, are some, there are some differences, but I wouldn't say this is a major factor. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you. But, uh, but if I may add to that, uh, would you say that the fact that Catholicism and Protestantism have had to interact with scientific development, which is mostly a Western product over the past thousand years or so, do you think that it has made their position towards science distinct from the Orthodox position? Can you say distinct? What, 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 are you saying positively or negatively? How it could be either. Actually, yeah. it could be either. And I would say both, actually. Obviously, yeah. you won't have uh, Giordani Bruni or Galileo or all those stories in, in the Eastern Orthodox Church, but uh, how, would you, how would you see the difference? Is there a difference? Uh, and I, if I may add, uh, since science really, became, among Orthodox countries, the only one where science really became important was the Soviet Union, the post-Orthodox, if you like. Uh, and uh, whereas previously, scientific developments were happening in Protestant Catholic countries. Uh, well, so modern scientific developments, yeah. Yeah, modern. I'm talking about yeah. 19th century, 12th, 20th century, modern science, professional science. Uh, uh, so how did it affect, uh, did it make it distinct? Uh, because the circumstances were different. Uh, you know, it's not as if science has been absent, or modern science uh, yeah. research and, and discovery has been absent in the Eastern Orthodox countries. Uh, I just mentioned two names, Tesla and Mendel. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, Tesla was a Roman Catholic monk, but oh, still, was? Yeah. But still a, uh, we're talking about two giants in the field of science. Uh, I'm glad you mentioned Galileo. Mm -hmm. and the reason is, I used to teach Galileo when I taught great books at, at George Washington University. Uh, it, was, it was a collection of essays and, and, and writings, observations. In a, a rather uh, strangely named great book, great, great text, Letter to the Grand Duchess Christina of Tuscany. In that letter, Galileo lays out his vision of faith or religion and science. And he was, a, he was a devout Catholic. He was under house arrest. He was silenced by the Pope. But as far as I know, uh, there have been recent biographies of him and his daughter, by the way. He never lost his faith. He never abandoned his faith, his Catholic faith. And, and a, a quip or a line that I think is so memorable, I've adopted myself, myself as a Russian Orthodox priest and theologian. How does he, he says, how do we reconcile the apparent discrepancies between, say, events in the Bible and what the new scientific discoveries were revealing. Because he was a uh, perfecter of the telescope, he discovered the, uh, the moons of Jupiter, uh, the, 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 the surface of the, of, the, of the Earth moon itself. Very innovative, very uh, uh, unprecedented work in astronomy. The way he looked at, at faith and science, or in this case, Christianity and science, was the, the intention of the Holy Spirit is to teach, uh, teach one how to go to heaven, not how the heaven goes. <laughs> and I, say, I think that encapsulates the idea of domains or realms. These are not in opposition, or they need not be in opposition. Holy Spirit, of course, the third person of the Trinity in, in Christian teaching, or we say God in general. God and science are not antithetical. Faith, in this case, Christian faith and science are not antithetical. They are complementary. In fact, I think to be a, a full Christian, and I'm speaking as an Orthodox Christian, we embrace science. Now, we don't embrace it uncritically or blindly or uninformed. We, we have to be critical and discerning and measured and wary. But look at what science has brought us. Here we are sitting in a, in a building. We have electric lights over here. Uh, we have ways of, of well, these are originally painted icons, but photographs, paper, metal, clipboard, pens. Look at the clothes we're wearing. Manufactured in mass production. Tech. So science and technology have wrought tremendous wonders in, 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 the, in the modern world. There have been the downside. But we have to take, I think, a very discerning view. 
And I think uh, Galileo's approach is that there are ways of interpreting Scripture that are fully within the tradition of the church. But where there is a clear, on, on a, ma- a clear difference on a matter of science or even history, then, as he would put it, we have to reinterpret the text because we're, we're, we're imposing something on the text that the text is not meant to be. The Bible was never meant to be a textbook in science or history or even philosophy. It's revealed truth. That's the domain. I'm not saying it's not factual, it's not historical, there's lots of history, there's a lot of factual material. But it also has other literary forms, uh, parables and allegories and, and um, uh, sayings and uh, narrative forms. I think Galileo captures it perfectly. Yeah, yeah it's surprisingly uh, modern. What he said is surprisingly modern. Well, early 17th century, where yeah. it, that's the century of science, uh, the science revolution. Right. right. Well, so, in your opinion, there's no problem for an Orthodox believer to become a scientist. Moreover, it may even strengthen his faith or her faith. Yes. In fact, um, I encourage uh, the study of science. All four of my children, I didn't, I didn't have to bend their arms. They, they, they were willing to listen to the old man. <laughs> Uh, I, I helped them with their college admissions process. Uh, I actually helped them, in, initially at least, uh, choose courses. I was like an unofficial advisor. I wasn't a helicopter pilot, but I was very much involved in education. And they knew, you know, mom has her, her gifts and her, um, her contributions to the family, which are myriad. Dad's good for at least one thing, <laughs> getting into college and, and, and thriving in college because I'm, I'm, I'm a scholar and, a, and, a, and, a, and, a, and an educator. All four of them, at my suggestion, took for their college science, they've all been the, the same high school, they all went to very good schools, they took a course in astronomy. And depending on which school, I think my son only had one physical science he had to take, so he took astronomy. Um, the other course was either in biological evolution or something like that. Because these are the cutting edge fields within science today. Mm-hmm. Uh, they've had, oh, they all had chemistry, they had biology, chemistry, physics, usual panop- uh, sequence in, in uh, physical science, a little bit of geology in, in high school. Rather than just repeat that, because uh, not, not one of them intended to be science oriented or scientist. Uh, but I wanted, I'd take, the two, take the two courses that really are at the frontier. Because we have to agree with everything, but at least take those courses. And they did. Mm-hmm. And that's my own kids. So if I'm going to recommend my own kids to take these courses in science, uh, which are not necessarily safe courses, um, a lot of controversy about some of these topics, at least they're, they, they become aware of what, what's, what's happening in the society and, and where is science going, what's good, what's dangerous in it, and so on. And how, not just your children, but would you say a person of the faith in general, how would that person make the judicial decision, okay, this I take, this I don't take, this works with my faith, this I'm not so sure about. You know, when you're going out there studying evolutionary science or, or astronomy, etc., you are exposed to many ideas. So, as you said, like unsafe territory. How do you educate Orthodox Christians to to face these issues, to understand them, and to learn how to relate to them. I'm going to go back to a fourth century church father. I feel very comfortable in that era. In fact, if I had to choose a century, maybe sixth century would be the best. Uh, although I love the present, I wouldn't. Change, I wouldn't want to go back into pre-electricity and no baseball and and medical, you know, rather primitive medicine. But nonetheless. The fourth century was the century uh, after the Edict of Milan by the Emperor Constantine who liberated the Christian community from oppression at the hands of his predecessor emperors. And it became a flowering of the church. In fact, ironically, by the end of the century, because of the Emperor Theodosius, only Christians were allowed to serve in the military whole government position. So we went from being the persecuted to the I wouldn't say persecutor, but to the, to, to the restrictor. 
not a very good ending, but at least in the heyday of the fourth century, when St. Basil the Great lived, of Cappadocia, which is now in what is now Turkey, he had a, a, one of his famous treatises, well, everybody reads this in our, in, in our church, Instruction on, to Youth. And his approach, which was typical of that day, and even a few earlier centuries as well, was we should be, our youth should be well-read in what we now call the classics. In those days, it was just recent history. The philosophers, Plato, Aristotle, the Stoics, the Epicureans, all of them. Literature, Homer, Virgil, and whatever science was out there, uh, for example, there was the, uh, the, the school of Hippocrates or Hippocrates. Um, there was the Roman Galen of Pergamum. I once had my students at George Washington read, uh, I forgot the title of the text. I had them read uh, Galen's famous uh, text, which was the medical um, text for schools of medicine, even as, as late as the early Middle Ages, uh, or the, the but the, maybe it's before before um, 12th century, still being used. His students call he was Ger, uh, Galen of Perg Pergamum. G Galen of Pergamum, also Asian mind. They called it Galen of Purgatory because it was hard to read that thing. <laughs> but I wanted to read. This is what science was. You know, the idea of bleeding as as a way of mm. uh, uh, expelling the humors. This was primitive stuff. And but some of Hippocrates' um, uh, writings in the school were primitive too. And there's a, 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 a number of other great at that time, medical um, forebears, to read that as well. And of course, Ptolemy was, was, was the astronomer. We know he was way off base, but for his time, not so bad, right? But that was St. Basil's approach, was to read that text, because this is, the, this is the, the patrimony of the West. This is of the Roman Empire at that time, of the Christian faith, standing astride um, uh, the uh, the Jewish heritage of the Old Testament and, and the Hebrews, and of course then the classical traditions. This was education. One was to be educated in, in just about everything. But one had to be selective in discerning and interpreting these texts. Not everything is self-evidently true. Some things are dangerous, some things are, 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 are um, uh, not helpful, some are just plain wrong. And we know, for example, the science in those days has been overshadowed uh, completely. You know, Ptolemy, and then you have Galileo, and, and, and Kepler, uh, and Copernicus. But still, for his time, uh, Ptolemy was, wasn't so bad. But the point is, to be reaching out, to be trying to learn as much as you can about everything, that is the, the approach of these great church fathers. And so anyone who would say, well, we shouldn't study these subjects or we should just uh, avoid them entirely, um, that's not the, the true orthodox tradition. Well, if I may, this, is, this concerns the content of science, but uh, someone who was neither Christian nor any religious man, Robert Oppenheimer, mm. uh, said that we have known sin mm. after the explosion of the nuclear weapon. Uh, so there's an ethical responsibility for the uses of science, uh, because the the discovery of the fission of the atom by itself was not destructive. It's the use that, according to Oppenheimer, constituted a sin even before the bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. He said that at the first explosion. Exactly. So how do you relate to that idea that this ethical responsibility uh, makes some uses sinful. I'm glad you mentioned Oppenheimer. Uh, he's reputed to have said at the moment of observing the explosion uh, at the misbegotten name Trinity. I'm not happy with oh, that Trinity, name. Trinity, I always yeah. find that to be this, oh, horrible <laughs> association. Los Alamos. He quotes an ancient he um, a Hindu text, I am become Shiva, destroyer of worlds. Mm. So even he resorts to a, uh, a religious image, uh, going back to Hinduism. I think the question is, can science be put to destructive use 
unworthy use. Yes, it happens frequently. Anything can be, can be distorted. Anything can be used for, for ill purposes. And in terms of science, I think there are some areas that I would demarcate. In other words, no Orthodox Christian in good conscience should engage in these, uh, in this particular form of scientific research or, or application uh, in technology. And one of them is in, in, um, in biology, genetic manipulation really concerns me. Now, there can be perhaps wonders coming from that. We've seen in a lot of, of uh, especially in the biological sciences, where we're dealing with, with living organisms, not just uh, physical matter or energy. There are persons involved. And that's always the primary focus for an Orthodox Christian, the person. The Greek word hypostasis is so profoundly significant. It means a specific, unique, unrepeatable mode of existence. Now think of what that means. It's applied to, to God in, in terms of the tripersonal unity that, that we Orthodox Christians and other Christians affirm. It applies to angelic order. It applies to, to human beings. No other level. No other creatures or, or, or the divinity. Un specific, unique, unrepeatable. There'll never be another you or another you or another me. We are unique. And that, that shows the demand for respect that each one of us should show toward each other. It's not as if when we're, we're destroying a whole species in, uh, in, in warfare or in carelessness toward the environment. That's bad enough. But when a person dies or when a person's life is taken, especially unjustly, that person, on earth at least, ceases to be. There will never be another one. You can't get another, another person just like you. Uh, something because I was talking today with my, with my students in, in, in terms of pastoral, theology, uh, pastoral application of our, of our approach to the do to death and dying. One of the worst things you can do is, and this is for any clergyman, any, any person, when someone says, I lost my child, or if you visit a hospital and the, and the baby dies, and they, believe it or not, people actually say this, well, you're young, you can always have another child. That's not what they want to hear at that moment, and that is so ill-advised because that child is gone. That child who was, again, specific, unique, and unrepeatable is gone. There's no replacement. So that's, how, that's why a person is so important to us. As, as Christians, as Orthodox Christians in particular. With genetic manipulation, we don't know where that's going to lead. The research currently under, underway to achieve human cloning, this is something that I find monstrous. It's a strong word. I don't know what the purpose of it is. I, I, I've never been able to understand why would anyone wish to do that except in science fiction movies for a good yarn. Clones. Uh, Boys of Brazil. <laughs> they were cloning Hitler for crying out loud um, in that movie. Thank God a movie. Not a, not a reality. But on a, even in the best of intentions, the best of intentions to clone someone, what would be the purpose? I don't see it. Uh, maybe a child was lost in an accident, and maybe you want, to you want to clone that child through DNA and therefore have that child back. That's macabre in many ways, but I understand why people would be motivated, but I'm, I'm going to offer a, a distinctive, I would say even unique, Christian perspective, even Orthodox, on the problem of cloning. And here's where, again, the, the cooperation, the collaboration even between religion and science is so vital, and it's something that's part of our, of our tradition. We believe, as well as Christians, that Jesus of Nazareth was the second person of the, of the Holy Trinity, the person of the Son of God, who took on human nature at the, incarna at the incarnation from the conception all the way up to the, the birth in his life. So here was a divine person with two natures, divine and human. That's how the Council of Chalcedon in 451 AD proclaimed 
this mystery of how could Jesus be both God and man? Uh, one person possessing two natures. What would cloning entail? And I thought about this quite a bit. You're taking genetic material from one person and trying to replicate that person. So what would you have? If it were even feasible, I don't think it is. I pray to God it isn't feasible. But if it were possible and if it happened, you would have the same nature, the same genetic code, the same DNA, the same constitutive aspect of, of a human being, one nature in two persons, one being superfluous. That is not just bad science, that's blasphemous. So I would say cloning is an area that I'm very concerned about. Then there's also medical research uh, for more weapons. Now, I'm, I'm not against the idea of defensive weapons. I've been a chaplain uh, for 24 and a half years of my life before I retired. I write about war and peace, uh, the justifiable war tradition, as well as the pacifist tradition as well. There, there are two of these venerable traditions. Not holy war, out of the question, but justifiable war and pacifism. But there are some weapon systems or scientific research to create weapon systems that are intrinsically ill-guided, and I would even say intrinsically evil. They cannot be controlled, and therefore they're dangerous to everyone on the face of the earth. And I think particularly in biological areas. To develop even new, lethal, virulent biological pathogens for biological weapons. There is no good science in that. It's, science could be neutral, perhaps. If they can do it, maybe scientists, some of them will do it. But ought they to do it? No. Here's where the moral theologian in me speaks. Don't go that route. What you create, Pandora's box doesn't even begin to describe what can happen there. No. So it's prudent as well as I would say moral, for scientists to exercise self-restraint. Just because you think you can do it, don't necessarily do it. Well, on that I wonder, oh, um, because science, scientific researchers will continue, you know, they'll, they might go down that rabbit hole. What ethical or regulatory bodies do you think can actually constrain the development of these scarier sciences? Well, that's not really in my area of expertise, frankly. Yeah. Um, I do, I do a lot of my, my, my work in moral theology is, is particularly in terms of public, uh, the public square. Um, so I'm not averse to um, to offering a position, stating a position on certain policy matters, legislation, and so on. But when it comes to science, I, I, I'm, I, I don't feel that I have the expertise there mm -hmm. to, right. to pontificate, certainly. Oh, fair enough. However, uh, what I've already said, I think, is more of general principles as opposed to particular policies or, or how will the legislative or, or administrative um, bodies control this. Uh, that'd be more of a tactical area. I'm still in the area of strategy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I'll add it, I'm switching gears a little bit. Um, how can science as content and method contribute to orthodox theology and practice? I want to go back as a case in point to that same formula in Chalcedon <laughs> outside of Byzantium. In, uh, this, ca in this, this case, uh, again, 451 AD. But this time, I'm going to invoke, as my muse, John Polkinghorne, one of my favorite writers on science and religion. John Polkinghorne was, a, I should say is, a theoretical physicist, physicist from Cambridge, well-respected scientist in theoretical physics and mathematics. I think he was like 43 or 44 when he decided to go back to Cambridge, well, he was already at Cambridge, he, was, he got his degrees from Cambridge, he went to one of the divinity schools at Cambridge to become an Anglican priest. So here we have a theoretical physicist of wor worldwide renown becoming a priest. So here is 
the best of both worlds. Pure science on one side, and faith, in this case, Anglican Christianity on the other side. And for him, in his life, he has tried to find not just points of intersection, collaboration, but commonality, and also maybe even, even identity. He proposed something, when I read it, I, I probably le le leaped out of, the, out of the chair. I thought this was a brilliant analogy. How do Christians, again, understand this, this mystical, often mystifying reality of Jesus Christ as we experience him and have known him? He's both God and man. He's not half God and half man. He's not Hercules. He's fully God, fully man, and yet, how could that be? Subsisting in one person. Because God and humanity, one is creator, one is the creation. There's a vast gap there. Well, he points out in one of his lectures that as a result of the quantum physics, we now know that light can be both wave and particle at the same time. Now, this is mind-boggling. It's either wave or particle. But no, it can be, because again, you have the uncertainty principle. Quantum physics, not Newtonian, Quantum physics has allowed for this, this discovery of light. And he, and he explicitly makes that connection, John Polkinghorne. Wave and particle, divine and human natures in the same entity. Light, in this case, Christ. And of course, it's no accident that in the Gospel of John, Christ is called the light of, light of the world. <laughs> so it's a very, a very happy analogy. But I, I, that's one reason why I love reading John Polkinghorne, a Templeton Prize winner, um, and because he, he's, doing, he, he's doing what Galileo laid out as the, as the domains of, of, the, of the Holy Spirit and, and Christian experience, revelation, and science. He's finding ways how science can give us new, stronger understanding of our own faith. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, how faith can also restrict science. Uh, he's not naive, John Polkinghorne. Uh, he's very much aware of the overreach of some scientists and some science, and he's willing to criticize that. But he is on, he's in both camps. He himself is a kind of an example of his own, his own example. He's both a scientist and a, and, a, and, a, and, a, and a priest, an Anglican priest, subsisting in the same person. <laughs> He puts on one hat or the other, I guess. Uh, you can't wear both at the same time, but he, he can switch hats at will. I see. Very interesting. There may be questions that we haven't asked and you would like to answer. Perhaps you want to say, to say something we didn't ask. Hmm. Well, maybe just expand on some things you already have and, and I, I've addressed. Um, about Again, what are some of the overreaches of science today? I mentioned a few. I, I would go into another, a, a few more areas in terms of biology. In the Orthodox moral tradition, as well as the Roman Catholic, and some Protestant Christian traditions, the, uh, the, the practice of abortion of unborn children or preborn children is reprehensible. Morally, a priori, an abomination. And in a way, modern science has given us even more validation for that position. This is one of the few moral issues for which there is not a single dissenting view from the Bible all the way up to the Church Fathers until modern times, at least in Orthodoxy. Um, I understand from my Roman Catholic friends that uh, Thomas Aquinas sort of waffled a bit, maybe at the moment of quickening, but then he came back at the end. The, the ancient church, and again, this is, this is such an astonishing fact, and I want to stress this. Not a single text from the second century on, the, the New Testament doesn't even mention abortion. It's so out of the question, or infanticide. It doesn't mention them. They were practiced, but it, was, it wasn't even a question to raise. Can we do this? So, well, obviously not. But from the earliest text, one called the Didache, another the Epistle of Barnabas, these are pseudonymous works, not written by the, the authors that they claim to be. The Twelve Apostles did not write the Didache, I don't think, at least. 
second century work in Greek, and nor did the Barnabas, the, the, the apostle, companion of Paul for a while, write the epistle of Barnabas. For the first time in writing in the Christian era, we have texts that say you may not procure, an, you may not destroy the unborn child, or you may, uh, you may not procure an abortion. It's enlisted with, there, there's the way of light and the way of darkness, the way of life and the way of death. Abortion is death and darkness. Every single extant patristic text that even addresses the question of abortion is resolutely opposed to it. It's a unanimous tradition. Now, of course, in Judaism, it's a little bit more nuanced. I understand how that works in terms of, uh, especially if, if one is, strikes a pregnant mother and so on. Uh, but there's, there's really no nuance here for the Orthodox Christian tradition or the, the ancient church and the medieval church until maybe Aquinas in the West. But we have no doubts about this. And now modern science with genetics and DNA comes into the picture. The question of when life begins, is it quickening? Is it three months? Is it six months? Those are moot. We know at the moment of fertilization of human sperm and the human egg, there is that chromosomal rearrangement. That's it. From that moment on, from fertilization, which by the way used to be called conception, until I think there was maybe 1980s, conception was delayed until maybe implantation, the 10th day. I see no ontological difference, that's just a convenience. Nothing is changing except whether the, the embryo lives. But from the moment of fertilization, the chromosomal rearrangement has occurred. There's, there's a direct continuity from that moment until death. That entity, that human conceptus and embryo and so on, can only become one creature, human being. It cannot become a horse or a daisy or a rock. It is going to be a human being. That, as long as there's nurture and nutrients, that's all we need. Here's biological science validating the moral position that whether we allow for the abortion or not, we cannot argue intelligently that that's not a human being and nothing else. Now, the term person is sometimes a legal debate, but I've already established uh, early in, in this conversation that the, the apostasis, the person, is, is, is a, a concept going back to the, especially the fourth century AD, uh, we have, we have, we're, we're pretty clear on that. The, the specific, concrete, unrepeatable mode of existence. That's all that that human zygote, uh, human conceptus will become as human person. So in that sense, science is actually bolstering our very strong, very strict, very unyielding moral position on that issue of abortion, which is a so-called medical practice. But would it be an ethical principle derived from science or just an ethical principle which is supported by scientific evidence? Because scientific evidence is changing by definition. Uh, isn't it too risky to base one's ethical principles on any scientific discovery? No, no, we're not basing it on that. I'm just, I'm just supporting it. I, I'm, I'm uh, uh, applying that scientific discovery and now common knowledge about human fertilization, as I'm drawing that on a support. Mm -hmm. This is validation, mm -hmm. scientifically, of what is a religious and moral position mm -hmm. that we've had from the very beginning. Yeah. And not only that, but you go back in, 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 into the Bible. We, we, the, the usual pro-life arguments are pretty clear on this. Psalm 139, uh, uh, how the Lord, uh, how the psalmist is speak, quoting the Lord, how I've knit you in your mother's womb. I mean, then there's, then there's Jeremiah, uh, I knew you before you were born. Uh, and then there's, in the New Testament, there's uh, the, the encounter between the Virgin Mary and her, her cousin, Elizabeth. And Elizabeth is already six months pregnant. And it says, the babe leapt in the womb at the greeting. And, okay, there's, there's a little movement there. But the, the Greek word there is brepos. 
The word brephos is the same word you would use for baby or babe. There's no distinction in the New Testament, or I dare say in the Old Testament, between a fetus and a breathing child outside the womb. Mm -hmm. The only difference from a moral or even an ontological perspective, which is theological or philosophical, is location. Mm -hmm. Aging up to the full nine month period as usual. Um, but then instead of in the womb, that child is outside the womb. Instead of breathing amniotic fluid or immersed in that, he's breathing air. Um, the idea that that he can survive outside the womb. No baby can survive outside the womb without human intervention. Uh, a baby can't even, can't even feed himself or herself. So the idea that, that they did all distinctions without a difference, without, without a meaning. These are, these are false distinctions. And I've been a pro-lifer all my life, and I'm just delighted to see how science now is, I won't say it's catching up, but it's, it's providing yet another validation of what we have known in the Orthodox Church from the beginning with the universal witness of the Church Fathers, at least the implied teaching in the scriptures. Of nothing, the word abortion does not appear, but, um, but the idea that the, 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 the unborn child in the womb is, is human and so on and, and worthy of protection, that's, that's self-evident in the scriptures. Um, so here's, here's again a nexus of religion and science that I think works to, well toward our tradition. All the more reason why those who destroy the unborn child, no matter what the reason given, no matter what the justification, and it used to be there had to be a good justification, um, health of the mother, life of the mother. We're at the point now, we're pretty close in this country, and other countries do this. No justification is needed. This is the woman's choice. She should have the opportunity to do this, no matter what the circumstances, no matter what her, her motives or who else is involved. It becomes a right, and it's a right that's not from heaven, it's from hell. Therefore, it's not a right. Thank you.